Okay, looks like we're live. I want to thank everybody for tuning into this program. And I'm just sharing my screen. I'm going to try to pull up my uh, software in a bit. Um, actually, I, I'm really pleased. I'm thrilled with, uh, with 2023. I was looking through my, um, let me just go to my channel real quick. I was looking through, uh, you know, over my channel and all the content that I produced in 2023 is really, really great. I mean, I did interviews, I did, you know, discussions, I did, um, I mean, just all of these great interviews. And now I, I, of course, I didn't agree with what every person I interviewed with uh, has said um, by any means. I mean, there's there's been people, of course, that I disagree with. Um, but, you know, the, the key, let me see if we can get more of these. Uh, here we go. No, nope, that's not it either. Yeah, we don't want to do that. Um, but anyways, yeah, I mean, it's it was a really a great year, and I really enjoyed, um, you know, I thoroughly enjoyed doing all of these interviews. And so what 2023 was really about is about providing like a good cross-section, right, of all the different views that are out there. And then when I got to the end of 2023, that's when I said, well, you know, I've provided all of these, you know, this spectrum of views. And I've, we've did, we did, um, you know, interviews, we did discussions, we did some, I, I uh, mod uh, moderated some debates. And then I said, well, you know, I've had these people, you know, I've had a few people, you know, weigh in and say, hey, you know, you need to produce your own content because, you know, you're starting to get into the debate waters now yourself. I mean, I did a debate with Sam Frost a couple of weeks ago, and I'm doing another debate in uh, February with Robert Genis. He's a well-known Catholic apologist. He's got 45 books to his credit. You know, he's got you know, 40 to 50 years of theology study behind him. And so I said, well, you know, I need to start doing some stuff too. And I remember way back when I think it was, I think it was Jeremy from New Heaven and New Earth Unveiled. He said something to me to the effect of, well, you know, you never tell us what you think about doctrine. And my response at that time was, I think it must've been probably about, you know, sometime maybe the first quarter of last year, my response at that time was, well, I'm working my way to that. I'm actually, right now I'm doing interviews. I'm doing, um, you know, live discussions and all that kind of stuff. But eventually I want to turn, I want to get more, you know, establish more of a teaching platform, which I really haven't done in, in a while. And so, uh, so I figure, well, 2024 is going to be a little bit different. I mean, I'm still going to do interviews most likely, um, but the interviews are going to be more, they're going to be more hand selected only because my focus, my goal for this year will be to expose. I don't like to use that word expose because it's really something that, that just has to be combated more than exposed. I mean, it's, you can expose it. Yes. But really is going to be moving against providing ammunition against Hellenism and neo-Gnosticism. And I realized you know, a couple weeks ago that, you know, it's, it was Hellenism to begin with that was, that causes all of these different views and opinions within Christendom. And so this is the reason for all the multitude of opinions. And, you know, basically, you know, my position is based on self-evident truth. And to me, it's self-evident, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit, but to me, it's self-evident that, you know, if you have 20 people, 20 different people in the room, all saying something completely different, well, they all can't be right. I mean, that's self-evident. In fact, you could even take it a step farther and say, well, then most, of, you know, most of them are going to be actually be wrong. And so here it is, my channel, you know, all things eschatology, which is really, that's exactly what it is, is all things eschatology. And you have all these different positions. So you have everything from you know, pre-mill, which there really wasn't that much of. Um, I'm kind of regretful that I didn't get a chance to interview more um, pre-millennialists. But we had ah-mill, we had post-mill, we had partial preterist, we had nondescript preterist, we had full preterist, we had uh, full preterist universalist, we had full preterist IO, we had uh, atheist, 
we had, I mean, the list goes, we had some guys saying, well, everything was fulfilled in the, in, you know, in, in 164 BC and the, the whole new Testament is just a make-believe. And so you can imagine that we, you know, when, when I go back, you know, at the end of the year and sift through some of these views, you could just imagine that it's like, wow, what, why can't we get it right? And of course, you know, you, the viewer, um, you know, if you participated on one of these programs, you might even be asking yourself, well, you know, why can't Christendom get it right? And so I'm going to be doing some shows upon, upon these themes. I've got one show coming up called, and I'll go there in just one moment. Let me go ahead and get back to my YouTube. Let's see. Come on, YouTube. Here we go. So I've got a few shows coming up, and let's see, I want to check out my channel. Let's see. So one show that's coming up is going to be called, uh, this is coming up actually Sunday evening. It's called Catholics and Protestants Are Both Wrong. Now, this is kind of like an in-your-face title. You know, Catholics and Protestants are both wrong. Well, actually, they're also partly right. I think Catholics got some things right. And I think Protestants have some things right, but they miss the mark on some like things that are not minor at all. They're, they're actually major. And so what I'm going to be doing is rightly dividing Christendom, showing where the Protestants, you know, drop the ball and then where the Catholics drop the ball and then showing where I'm coming in. And of course, I don't pretend to be any Superman, you know, solving uh, this controversy, but where I'm coming in, where I'm coming from is, you know, confessedly, um, from a position that I've held for many, many years, these are matured views. These are not views that I pulled out of a hat yesterday. Um, I've had many, many years to think through the ramifications of everything I believe. I, I can articulate them. I, I mean, I even in said in, in almost a boasting fashion, which I really wasn't boasting, but you know, uh, I could do, I could, I could do a debate or a discussion without any preparation whatsoever. Um, you know, somebody called me, like Donnie called me and said, hey, man, you know, we got this guy that wants to do a debate tonight, but the other guy stepped out. Can you can you step in? I wouldn't need any 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 preparation. I might need like maybe 15 minutes to, to like just do a rough, a rough uh, draft of notes. But to be honest. I know my position so well. I know my theology environment. And that's what I think every apologist needs to work himself up to, is articulating theology in a real-time environment. If you can't do that, like if you need time to like think and, uh, you know, and research before you can answer a question, then you shouldn't be doing apologetics. You really, you really shouldn't because you're not prepared to defend the faith, you have nothing to defend. You have to prepare your defense before you can defend it. And that, of course, is, um, you know, is not the best scenario. So uh, that's coming up. And then we've got another one coming up. And actually, this one I've been wanting to do for a while, but no, that's not it. Let's see. Let me try to find it. Here we go. So this this one right here is this was actually the synagogue of Satan is the serpent seed among us. This one was supposed to be um, it was supposed to be an interview with Paul W. Uh, after AD 70. He's been on this channel off and on for for since I started it, really. But um, he's like 12 hours ahead or I don't remember if it's ahead of me or before, or, you know, before me. He there's like a 12 hour time zone difference between us. And so um, he's having a lot of issue, a lot of trouble. Um, you know, he's got like eight kids. And so he's having like a lot of trouble finding the time to do it. And plus he wanted to take like a really, um, I don't want to say antagonistic approach, but, you know, he's like name calling and like point, you know, stuff like that. He, I just want to talk about the doctrine. I don't want to get into names. I don't want to get into people and stuff like that. So we agreed to, um, you know, to, to, to put it on, you know, to uh, make a rain check. And I said, well, I still want to do the, the actual, you know, the study lessons. So since we hold a similar view, a somewhat similar view on the synagogue of Satan, I figured I'm going to do this myself. And so that's going to be on the, here we go, me not knowing the day. Um, that's going to be, I believe, 
Okay, on the 11th, right. So, yeah, so that's what's coming up. And it's pretty, it should be a good one. But tonight, what I want to talk about is, I want to talk about, I want to talk about before and after Acts 28. And I've always said this, you know, in any of my discussions or debates, I've always mentioned Acts 28. People are like, why are you mentioning Acts 28? Why is Acts 28 so significant? Well, we're going to talk about that a little bit tonight. It's going to be real light study. It's not going to be anything super duper in depth. But my view is, I'm just going to, I'm just going to tell you right up front. My view is similar to dispensationalism because I tend to hold a very straightforward, you know, view of, of scripture, you know, prophecy, you know, straight, straightforward, you know, nothing too convoluted, nothing, you know, nothing esoteric or anything like that. Of course, I do hold that a lot of prophecy is typological. I think the whole Old Testament is typological. And so when you come to passages like that talk about like a temple where, you know, bloody sacrifices are being offered, well, yeah, you see the anti-type in the New Testament. You see that in like Revelation 21. It's a different, it's the fulfillment, right? But you do have to, you do have to understand the difference between type and anti-type. Otherwise, you're going to be holding views like, you know, like dispensationalism. And I'm not a dispensationalist. I'm actually a historic premillennialist. Some people get me confused as a dispensationalist because of my understanding of Israel and my understanding of the promises and the fulfillment of those promises. And so I just want to say that there is, I do believe in dispensations. I believe in ages and all that. But the way I, I combine everything together in my, in my um, resultant understanding, it looks a lot like what Irenaeus was teaching in the second century. So if you've ever read Irenaeus, um, it really looks, I mean, I'm, I'm so indebted to Irenaeus. I've, I, I can't think of any other theologian other than E.W. Bullinger that I'm, I'm so indebted to as Irenaeus. But anyways, I always like to say, if Irenaeus and E.W. Bullinger ever had a conference, ever had a sit-down conference, their theology would probably look exactly like mine. But anyways, but the main difference, the main difference um, between my view and dispensationalism is that I hold that there's only one people of God mentioned in scripture. Okay, there's, there's not two people of God, there's not two Israels, there's not, you know, Israel in the church, there's only one, one people of God mentioned in scripture. And that people is just going to surprise some of you, that people is Israel. Okay, so Old Testament Israel, New Testament Israel, it's all the same as two covenants, it's one people, two covenants. I think that's the best way to understand it. There's only one people of God, but there's two different covenants. And the two covenants really it kind of makes it makes them look like different people because you've got one that's under you know that's under uh you know earthly uh shadows and and what you want to call types you know with bloody sacrifices and all that and then you've got the other that when you get to that other covenant things change things flip and so under under each under each uh dispensation though under each uh covenant you have this notion of, of inclusivity. And so the inclus inclusivity is really at the heart of understanding Israel because there's a lot of people that hold that, well, you know, Israel's an exclusive, sort of ex exclusive ethnic people where you can't be a member of Israel unless you're actually of this specific bloodline. That I don't believe that view is correct at all. In fact, that's the view that I guess you would say that a lot of, I don't know if Max King held that view. I'm pretty sure that he did. He held like a telescopic view of the covenants and an exclusivity of, of the nation. So he held, what when I say telescopic, you know, the, um, it started, the promise started with, you know, Adam, and then it got transferred to Noah, right? Then it got transferred to, to Abraham's seed. And so when you get this telescoping effect, you narrow down the recipients, the privileged route of salvation, right? So it's Israel was the privileged route of salvation. But when you combine uh, that idea with the idea of exclusivity, well, what happens to everybody outside of that privileged center of blessing? Well, everybody outside is basically left, you know, high and dry. 
Um, they don't have any, you know, that's why you'll sometimes hear like IO people say, oh, the law was never for, for the, you know, and it's because they're holding this exclusivity. Well, we got to go back to the earlier covenants. We've got to go back to the Adamic covenant. We've got to go back to the Noahic covenant. And uh, of course, the, the Abrahamic covenant to see that there always was that from the very, from Genesis chapter three, the promise always was for all mankind. It's just that the privileged, the privileged route was, was one nation. And this got revealed successively. And so um, I think the best, the best way to see, the best scripture I can go to to prove that Israel is an inclusive uh, gathering, an inclusive nation, is Exodus chapter 12, where, let's see, Exodus chapter 12, and this is pretty, I would say this is probably one of the most important chapters in the Bible because he's talking about the institution of the Passover. And let's see, here we go. And he says, this is the ordinance of the Passover, where in verse 43 he says, there shall no stranger eat thereof, but every man's servant that is bought for money, when thou hast circumcised him, then shall he eat thereof. A foreigner and a hired servant shall not eat thereof. In one house shall it be eaten. Thou shalt not carry forth aught of the flesh brought out of the house, neither shall you break a bone thereof. And he says, uh, in verse 48, he says, And when a stranger shall sojourn with thee, will keep the Passover to the Lord. Let all his males be circumcised, and then let him come near and keep it. And he shall be as one that is born in the land, for no uncircumcised person shall eat thereof. One law shall be to him that is homeborn and unto the stranger that sojourneth among you. So when you come to when you come to the New Testament, right? Well, who was Israel's Passover? Israel's Passover is Christ. And that's what rat his blood is what ratifies the new covenant. And so when Israel is flipped to the new covenant, what happens? Does this principle of, ex of inclusivity disappear? Absolutely not. In fact, um, you can still participate in Israel's Passover. Gentiles can still participate in Israel's Passover. But what do they need to do? They need to be circumcised. And that's why under the new covenant, circumcision is of the heart. That's why definitions change. Why Paul said, he which is a Jew is not, is, is not one outwardly. But circumcision is of the heart because now Israel has been placed under the new covenant. And so everything gets flipped. And so when I, when I say, uh, you know, Israel was, a, when, you know, on the day of Pentecost, it was a totally Jewish thing. God was returning to the nation of Israel. It was the prophecy of Joel was a Jewish prophecy. It was a prophecy to the nation of Israel. And that's exactly what was going on. God was returning to the nation of Israel and was grafting, I want to say grafting them in, that's probably the wrong way to put it, but God was fulfilling his promises under the new covenant. And so all the way up through Acts chapter 10, there was no Gentile. The only way a Gentile could uh, enter the covenant uh, of uh, covenants of Israel was he had to be joined to Israel and he had to be circumcised. So yes, there was, pro there were proselytes, right? But there was no, no uncircumcised uh, Gentiles that were being made partakers. Now that's where, where it changes is in Acts chapter 10, because Peter receives this vision, right? And so in Acts chapter 10, let me see if I can go there. And I've done a few, I've done a few um, studies on Acts 28 before. So you could always go back and look at those. There actually, there's a chart that I have too. I don't know if I'll have time to bring it up though tonight. But um, in Acts chapter 10, of course, Peter receives this vision. And his vision basically tells him that the Gentiles are okay. Um, we're not going to go through all that, but I do want to go to Let's see, Acts chapter 11, because it talks about, you know, when he entered into the house of uh, Cornelius, uh, of course, the, the Holy Spirit fell on the Gentiles. And then, uh, let's see. Let's see. And of course, um, 
that was probably uh, that was probably the last chapter. But anyways, when he was going back and he's t he's talking to the uh, to the uh, Jews in Judea, and he tells them about this, and then he he's re he's repeating what happened. He says, "Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost." For as much then as God gave them a like gift as he did unto us who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? And then they, uh, when they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. So what was the, what was the big difference between Acts 1 through 10 and um this point right here in Acts 10, where Peter goes into the house of Cornelius and the Holy Ghost falls upon them, it's because they were uncircumcised Gentiles. That was unheard of. Uh, it was unheard of for an uncircumcised Gentile to be made participator of Israel's promises, right? Um, without even being circumcised. There was no way. And that's why Peter needed a special revelation. So people think, you know, when they go back to Pentecost and they say, oh, that was, you know, that's where, you know, everything was, was fulfilled at the cross. And this is where, of course, everything, I don't even know what they think that, you know, you get different views, you get views, well, the law ended at the cross and then, you know, and there's, there's different opinions and there's different positions that people take, but I don't see the law ending at the cross. I see, you know, I see the law going all the way, all the way through until AD 70. Um, you know, and of course you have to understand, well, Christ, of course, yes, he fulfilled the law, right? And of course these ordinances, right? He fulfilled the ordinances as well. So he fulfilled the ceremony, he fulfilled the moral law and the ceremonial law. And of course, he had power to abolish the ceremonial law, right? And why, why, why did he have power to abolish the ceremonial law? Does anybody know? Um, well, I can give you a really good reason why he had um, power to, to, to fulfill the, to, to even change the ceremonial law. Number one, because he's God. And number two, because the ceremony, ceremonial law was never part of the old covenant proper was never part of the old covenant proper. As a matter of fact, if you go to, let's see, if you go to Exodus chapter, and this is, again, this is self-evident truth. And I'm going to show you how it's self-evident, because if you go to Exodus chapter 24, right? So after he gave the Ten Commandments, and then he gave uh, laws, which are basically, you know, love your neighbor as yourself. You know, if you see somebody's ox going astray, you bring it back to them, you know, stuff like that, just basically you know, judicial decisions and stuff. But then what does he do in, in, um, in, in Exodus 24? Moses actually ratifies the covenant with blood. So he wrote all the words of the Lord and rose up early in the morning and et cetera, et cetera. And then, of course, he, uh, he ratifies the covenant. He sprinkles, he sprinkles the book with blood. He says, behold, the blood of the covenant. What covenant is this? The old covenant which the Lord hath made with you concerning, uh, concerning all these words. Then went up Moses and Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, 70 of the elders of Israel, and they saw the God of Israel, and it was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of a sapphire stone, and as it were, the body of heaven in his clearness. And upon the nobles of the children of Israel, he laid not his hand, and they saw God and did eat and drink. So the covenant was ratified, the old covenant was ratified, and then in the next chapter, that's where we have the ordinances. So the ordinances were an add-on to the actual old covenant. They were not, they were definitely not the part of the old covenant. Now what they were, what they were is they were a provision for forgiveness, for, for covering, right? Um, for those who would transgress the Ten Commandments. So if you transgress the Ten Commandments, and God knew that they would, so he provided a ceremonial, um, a ceremonial covering for them. And of course, this becomes a real, real burden because every time you transgress the Ten Commandments, which happens constantly, we do this probably dozens of times each day, right? Even in our best moment, well, Let's just say the letter of it, we may not, but in the spirit of it, we do. And so, so what God does is he makes this provision, the ceremonial uh, law for them. And this is what, of course, covers their sins, their transgressions of the, of the law, of the old covenant, until the time when Christ comes and he, of course, fulfills this. 
And now what, what is it? What is the old covenant? And how does it get trans, uh, transformed into the law of the new covenant? Well, when Christ was on the Sermon um, on the Mount, right? And he was basically, you know, he was basically issuing the law of the new covenant. And then when he died, right, he, he spoke all the words to the people. And then when he died, he sprinkled the people with his own blood. This is the covenant that God hath enjoined unto you. This is the blood of the new covenant, right? And so where's the, where's the, provi the provision made for, uh, for disobedience, made for transgression? Now, it's, it's all located in the, in the true temple, which is in heaven. And so all you need to do now is just confess your sins, and he'll be faithful and just to forgive your sins. You don't have to go to the temple anymore. Right. You don't have to go to the uh, you don't have to, you know, get a lamb and bring them to the priest. You don't have to do all this stuff anymore. And so this is what this is what changes. And this is how the new covenant is ratified. So where does this what does this does this have anything to do with Acts chapter uh, ch chapter 28? Well, yes, it does. Yes, it, abs it absolutely does. We know that the sacrifices still went on all the way through until basically until AD 70. And so can you have the sacrifices still go on after Jesus Christ paid for sin on the cross? Of course you can, because that's what was happening in, in the book of Acts. So, but do those sacrifices have any kind of merit? No, absolutely not. Um, the blood of, of bulls and of goats never had any power to put away sin. I could only cover cover the sin in anticipation of Jesus Christ's shed blood. And so this is standard theology. I mean, if you don't like that, and I don't know anybody that, that won't like that, but there's some people that may not like that. That's your problem. That's not my problem. Um, <clears throat> what we do know is that the law is that the temple was destroyed in AD 70. And that's, of course, when the, the dispensation of Moses, the Mosaic dispensation cannot go on anymore but without, you know, without this, this ceremonial. Because the Torah, remember, the Torah is a way of life. And so you can't have Judaism. You can't have, well, you can't have real Judaism without a temple. And so the only way that you can get to God, the only way you can access God, the only way that you can worship God in this dispensation is through Jesus Christ. And so this is a big change, isn't it? Now, let me, let's see. Okay, so, so basically what we have is this. We have the Gentiles. So, so Israel is the covenant people. That doesn't change on the day of Pentecost. Stays the same, but what we have now is we have the Gentiles, they still have, they don't have any covenantal standing. So the Gentiles don't have any covenantal standing. So what happens? They have to be grafted in. And so we, we know that this can take place because number one, because no way, because of the Adamic covenant in the promise of, of the Messiah of the seed of the woman was promised to all of Adam's seed, right? And so you can't, you can't keep the Gentiles out of, of participation in these covenants because there was a prior covenant that was made with all of Adam's seed. But Israel's the privileged route. And so Gentiles have to be grafted in and they, they're, they're grafted in basically by faith in the new covenant. Now in the old covenant, they were grafted in by, by physical circumcision. In the new covenant, they're grafted in by spiritual circumcision. And let's see. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, Christ is Israel's Passover. And then of course the kingdom was promised to Israel. This telescopic view of the covenants, but it's inclusive. And what does this have to do with the book of Acts? And why, why should we, you know, why should we consider Acts 28 such a big, big turning point? Well, because all the way through the book of Acts, Israel's kingdom program was still on the front burner. And Paul basically, in the first part of his ministry, he basically went and he went into the synagogue first and he basically preached Christ in the synagogues. And then only when they, only when the Jews rejected his message, did he turn to the Gentiles. He preached the same message to the Gentiles. 
Now in Acts 28, what happens is he actually preaches to the Jews one last time. He gathers the, the chief of the, uh, of the Roman Jews at Rome and he preaches and Basically, he says, um, let's see, in 28, verse 17, he says, Men and brethren, though I have committed nothing against the people or customs of our fathers, yet was I delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans, who when they had, uh, had examined me would have let me go, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And, of course, um, he, um, many came to his lodging, verse 23, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets from morning till evening. And then it says, and some believed the things which were spoken and some believed not. And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed after that Paul had spoken one word, well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah, the prophet unto our fathers, going, uh, saying, go unto this people and say, hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see and not perceive, for the heart of this people has waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and that they will hear it. Now that's probably one of the most important uh, important sentences that you can even, even uh, think of, because when Paul says they will hear it, what he's basically saying is Israel rejected me. They wouldn't listen, right? He came unto his own and his own received him not. And then it's basically the, the whole New Testament in an uh, epitomized in a nutshell. The Jews wouldn't listen. And so the salvation was sent to the Gentiles. And this is progressive throughout the entire, uh, throughout the entire four gospels and the book of Acts. Their, their hardening of heart was progressive during this period. And at the same time that their hearts were being hardened, the door swings wider and wider open to the Gentiles until now we have in Acts 28, now the door is about to get thrown wide open, okay? So what happens after Acts 28, and this is the easiest way to uh, remember it, is that Israel's kingdom program gets placed on the back burner. And what gets put on the front burner is the, the current present church age. So my, my position is, and again, I might pull up my, I may pull up my, um, no, I don't think I can find my chart. Anyways, my position is, of course, that Paul knew, he knew what probably the other apostles didn't, well, they, maybe they did know. But he knew they were they were working on Israel's kingdom program. They were trying to get the Jews converted. They were trying to, you know, get the hope of Israel to 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 fulfillment. And Paul was at, at a certain point in Acts 28, he breaks off and then he just preaches unto the Gentiles. Now his he's like probably 10 steps ahead of all the other apostles because he knows that the Jews aren't going to aren't going to accept the gospel message. And he also knows that there's going to need to be a period of time during which the promises to bring Israel's kingdom to fruition are going to be postponed. And so what he's doing is he's setting up the present church dispensation. And so when we get to his um, prison epistles, okay, this is after Acts 28. So we're talking Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, right? Uh, First and second Timothy, um, Titus, uh, Philemon. In these epistles, basically, he changes a lot of his message. So, the way I the way I I like to um, explain it is is with this analogy. Suppose that suppose you're my friend on Facebook, right? And you see me post something saying, "Oh, I can't wait to go, uh, my, you know, to take my vacation." at Palm Springs in a couple of weeks. I can't wait. I'm, I'm psyched, right? And then you don't hear from me for a few weeks, right? Where you're thinking about, you say, well, I even heard, I even heard feeling, you know, haven't heard from him. I haven't seen him post anything. He must've really enjoyed his, his trip to Palm Springs. But now if I had posted something like a few days later, right after I made that initial post and I said something like, well, you know, I need to, you know, I'm doing some online shopping today. I'm getting some warm, you know, I need to get some warm clothes for the long winter. 
Uh, that's something that might, you know, you could look at that. Of course, if you didn't know anything about that statement or if you just ignored that statement, you might think that, you know, a few weeks later, or a couple months later, that I had already taken my trip to Palm Springs. But if you look at my subsequent statement saying I'm, you know, I'm, I'm buying up some clothes, I'm buying up some sweaters and some, you know, some cardigans and some nice warm socks and maybe a scarf, I'm getting ready for the long winter. Uh, well, maybe, you know, you can infer that something's changed, that perhaps maybe I'm not going to Palm Springs anymore, right? Now, if I didn't specifically tell you that I, I'm, I've changed my plans, you could still infer that from subsequent communications. And so my position as, as respects the epistles of Paul is that there's a change in tone. There's a change in urgency, okay? We can say that. And there's also a change in, pri in his prioritizing, his prioritization of certain doctrines between what he, what he wrote before Acts 28 and what he wrote after Acts 28. So a good example that I like to use is when he was telling the Corinthians, when he was talking about marriage, and he said, you know, he advised, he's, he didn't want, you know, people to start getting married, married, marrying and giving in marriage. He said, look, the time is short. You know, don't, you know, this is maybe something that's, that's not a good idea because the time is short. There's a present distress. You know, as he wrote in Romans, he said that the earth was, was groaning, creation was groaning right now is our salvation nearer than when we first believed uh, that the, 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 uh, the night is far spent, the day is at hand, right? The ends of the ages have come upon us. Well, once you get past Acts 28, he starts telling, he starts saying, well, First of all, the urgency of his writings, the sense of urgency disappears. We feel that we're on new ground. Instead of, you know, the kingdom coming to us and, you know, we're being caught up in the air. Now it's like we're being translated into the kingdom, right? Uh, instead of telling people not to get married, he's, Paul says in Timothy, he says, I will that the younger women get married. You know, we pr pray for long life. You know, we're to pray for rulers, people in authority. In other words, he's setting up a long-term dispensation. And so if you don't look at these, if you lump everything together, if you lump all the New Testament scriptures together without any reference to the time when they were written, right, you're going to just you're not going to interpret them correctly because you're going to, you're going to be assuming that he's talking about one thing. Whereas if you, if you not even understanding it in its chronological setting, right? Well, he might've said, yeah, he might've said, you know, the end is at hand, but then again, if something might have changed afterwards, that's why you have to study the new Testament texts in not only in their canonical order, uh, but in their chronological order. And that's why I appreciated um, you know, E.W. Bollinger's scholarship, because he was the first person that I know of uh, to, to actually bring this out. And so you get past Acts 28, and you find that Israel's kingdom program is no longer prominent. It's been placed on the back burner. Now, the th on the front burner is this present age. It's this present churchly dispensation, where now you have, instead of being at the ends of the ages, now Paul's talking about ages to come. Well, you mean ages to come? I thought we were at the ends of the ages. Well, now there's a mending. There's a, there's a Greek phrase. I don't have my, the particular translation that I, I, I would need to, to flesh it out, but there's a, um, there's a word in the Greek in, in the book of Hebrews, Paul talks about, it's talking about the readjustment of the eons. And it basically that word readjustment, it means a mending. In fact, the, the first uh, usage of the word is when, when, um, uh, when the evangelist is talking about the, the apostles were mending their nets. And so there was a break in this, this kingdom program. It was, it was prominent throughout the, uh, the, um, the Acts period. But then once you get to the end of the Acts period, this is where it takes the back burner. And of course, there's a mending, there's a readjustment of the eons at that point. So very um, important stuff. And, you know, I, I could, you know, I have chart, I, there's charts that I, I have from different books and other things that, that you can study, but the best, the best, um, let's see, that's not what I want. I want my downloads because let's see, 
Docs, message, calculator, gallery. I'm looking for my downloads. And guess what? I'm not going to be able to find them. Because my downloads, that's where I have my chart, my, uh, my prophecy chart. No, I don't have any pictures. And so this is a new computer, and so I'm not really, let's see, files. Here we go. This must be it right here. So yeah, this is my chart, and actually it's a, it's a pretty decent chart. It goes through all of the basic truths respecting, um, you know, the premillennial reign, you know, first Adam ruin, second Adam restoration, then you have this age starting from the fall of Adam all the way to the age to come. But what I want to really focus on, what I want to really focus on is this section right here in the middle where it says law of the new covenant, where AD 60 to AD, or eight, I'm sorry, AD 26 to AD 70, you have the kingdom at hand. And so the kingdom's at hand is talking about Israel's kingdom, right? Is if you, if you will obey my voice, right? Um, I will make you a nation of kings and priests. So when Christ comes along, all they have to do is receive their Messiah. That's all they have to do is repent first, right? Repent and then receive your Messiah. But of course, they wouldn't do that. And that's why this gets prolonged all the way through the end of this, uh, this, this, um, this overlap here until in AD 70, the, the temple is destroyed and then the Jews are, of course, scattered. So law of the new covenant uh, proclaimed, the law made spiritual, Matthew uh, chapters 5 through 7. And then when you get on the other side, you have the law, the new covenant uh, mediated by apostles. Acts uh, 2 AD 70. Remember, Paul said, if you have been partakers of their spiritual things, of Israel's spiritual things, you should also minister to them in carnal things. He was always taking up collections for the Jews at Jerusalem. That's because um, Jerusalem was the center of Christianity at that time, of course. That shifted to Antioch, as we know. The, uh, they were first called Christians at Antioch. But that just really helps to flesh out that really helps to um you know illustrate the changes that were going on during this period where you have the ministry of the 12 they were associated with israel's kingdom program and the sign of jonas was valid for 40 years remember the sign of jonas when um when jonas uh, went into the city of nineveh and said yet 40 days in nineveh will be overthrown and of course, this was um, there was a timer, right? There was a timer put on it. Forty days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. And of course, that's when the king and everyone else they they uh, they put on sackcloth and they mourned and they repented. And then God changed His mind. He postponed the judgment. Now He postponed it. How do we know that? Because in the book of Nahum, the prophet uh, prophet Nahum, that judgment is retaken up again. So it was postponed. It was deferred. But then the book of Nahum, that shows when it that actually recontinues the judgment and shows that it actually will take place. And so when the Gentiles repent, that automatically that 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 postpones the, the, the kingdom, right? Because what happens when the kingdom is established, the Gentiles are judged. In fact, if you go through the Old Testament and you look at all of the passages in which the day of the Lord is mentioned, and I, I don't know if it's every single one. I think it's pretty much most of the major ones. You'll find that they all uh, speak of a judgment, a uh, great judgment on the Gentiles, on the Goyim. And so what's going on when Paul says, you know, the word, uh, the word is going out to the Gentiles and they will believe. He says, this is what's going to happen. They will believe. And this Israel, this kingdom program uh, is going to be put on the back burner. And so in AD 70, when the 40 years are up, when the sign of Jonas, um, well, they had 40 years to repent and that 40 years is up. That's when the parousia gets postponed. And that, of course, corresponds to the 40 years in the wilderness when after the 40 years they enter the land. Now, I want to say something a little bit, a little something about that 40 years in the wilderness because the 40 years in the wilderness, I used to think, and for years I taught that there was a generation in the wilderness, right? There was just one generation. And then, um, you know, within the last few years, I realized, I said, well, there wasn't just one generation in the wilderness. There was actually two generations in the wilderness. 
The first generation was the one that came out um, came out of Egypt, right on the on the night of the of the Passover, right, and that was the generation that failed at Kadesh Barnea, right, when the spies went to search out the land, they failed, and their carcasses fell in the wilderness. But there was another generation, and I think it might be in Numbers, I, I don't remember the exact chapter, but there was another generation that succeeded that generation. And that was the generation that was brought to the plains of Moab and was given the second law, the Deutero, uh, nomos, right? Uh, the second law. They were brought to the plains of Moab right on the very edge of the entrance into the land of Canaan. And they were given a rehearse and a recap of their duties and privileges, as well as uh, warnings and encouragements to persevere and to, to keep the law. And so it's actually is, is false to say that there was only one generation in the wilderness. We speak of the generation in the wilderness. There were two. There was one whose carcasses died in the wilderness, right, on this side of the promises. And then there was another that actually believed, right? And they were the ones who were actually brought into the land under Joshua. So we know that Joshua was a type of Christ. And we also know that uh, I believe that the, that the ones who entered the land were the people like, <clears throat> like the apostles, the Jewish apostles that believed and their successors in the church, the Christian church, right? They entered the lands, they entered the churchly, this, this current dispensation, right? Whereas who got left in the land? Whose carcasses got left in the wilderness? Well, it was those who didn't believe. So it was the old generation. It was the generation under Moses that got left into the land. Now, <clears throat> we have being left in the land isn't enough, though, because there's other types. And when we get into the when I talk, when I do my um, when I do my podcast on the synagogue of Satan, I'm going to talk about the dispersion and I'm going to talk about how Cain was dispersed. Right. And he was evicted from the land after he killed his brother. But then he built this magnificent civilization that would end up rivaling the civilization of the sons of God and would eventually cause judgment to be brought upon the world. That's going to be a very, very interesting. In fact, that's going to be a very uh, important lesson because it's taking up, it's taking topology and it's properly applying it to the theology of the New Testament and to this New Testament age. So let me show you one more chart. And this one right here, I might have to blow this up a little bit. So this one right here, this is, I got this out of an old book years ago. I can't remember the name of it. In fact, I don't even remember the writer. I think. Well, I don't. I don't know. I don't know who, who wrote it. Um, it's one of those books that I guess didn't make it to. You know, when I moved, I guess it got lost, or I don't know what happens to it. But it has right here. It says Pentecostal dispensation not permanent, and then it says before Acts twenty eight and after Acts twenty eight, and then it gives a list of the different uh, scriptures. And then it has, it's a, basically it's a word study. It's a word analysis, right? So it says Jew is mentioned 25 times in the epistles before Acts 28. And then, of course, one time after Acts 20. It says Israel, Israelite. See the, the number of occurrences here in the pre-Acts 28 epistles. Moses to baptize, baptism, Lord's Supper. And so I don't agree with all of the implications of what this author was teaching. He was teaching, you know, like things like water baptism, don't, don't pass over. You know, I don't agree with everything, but you have to admit that this is re really uncanny, but, you know, you know, the analysis of these words, how things really do change when you get to these other epistles. Paul's message really does change. And so, let's see, I know there's another one that mentions the parousia. Yeah, the parous, here we go. Circum so circumcision is mentioned 23 times in the Acts period epistles, right? But only mentioned six times in Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians. And, and I, I bet you most of those times are when he's saying that the circumcision is, is of, of the heart, right? And then, of course, the parousia of the Lord. Now, we know the word parousia is used in some of those epistles, but it's talking about a parousia of, of another person you know, of the presence of somebody, of one of Paul's fellow helpers. But the parousia of the Lord is not mentioned in any of 
Paul's uh, epistles mentioned after Acts chapter 28. And so word studies like this, this is, I mean, this is, this is scholarship, right? I mean, but it's not the kind of scholarship that you could get from your seminary. It's not the kind of scholarship that you could even get from, you know, most theologians would don't know anything about this. Why? Because they're too busy with their creeds and confessions. They're too busy with their textbook theology in just repeating and rehashing what, you know, other theologians have told them that they have no there, they have, there's no place in their in their heads for new truth. And so they don't know anything about this. And of course, when you tell them saying, you know, there's a change in, in Acts 28, they, they're like a deer caught in the headlights. They don't know. And so you have to study this. And this, I've been studying this for a long time. I've, I've held these views since, you know, 2008, 2009. So it's like, I, I've already studied this stuff. Um, but this is really, really important. And I can't even, even imagine, I can't even imagine lumping all the scriptures together. Now, when I first, when I was a young Christian, you know, I did that, obviously, like we all do. When I was a young Christian, I used to lump those scriptures together and I used to be, oh yeah, man, you know, to all the time texts and must have happened <clears throat> without realizing that, well, you know, you have to, if you don't look, if you, you're not studying the scriptures in their chronological relation, then you're really missing out because sometimes the message Paul will, will change what he had previously said. He'll go back. And it's not that he's contradicting himself. He's not contradicting himself. What he's doing is changing. Cir the circumstances are changing throughout this period. Um, I mean, this is self-evident truth because when you study the book of Acts and you find out that, well, you know, there were no, I like to joke and say, well, you know, th there were no Lutherans on the day of Pentecost. There were no uh, Methodists on the day of Pentecost. There were no, uh, I don't even want to say Baptists, but there were no, you know, Episcopalians. There were no Presbyterians. You know, we think that, you know, our Christianity started on the day of Pentecost where really it didn't. Our Christianity starts really, all right, well, it starts, it starts in principle, it starts all the way back with Christ's ministry, right? We know that. And I'm not saying that that's not true. And it does start on the day of Pentecost, right? But what I'm saying is the particular dispensation we're in starts, I believe it started in AD 70. The reason I believe it started in AD 70 is because this is what this is what we've had since AD 70. We haven't had miracles. Now, I understand there's people out there who who do hold that, you know, the charismatic continue, and that's fine. Um, but as a general dispensation, do they continue? Um, I don't think so. And so we have, you know, raising the dead, you know, taking up snakes. These were all signs of the kingdom. Remember, Christ said, but if I if I do all these works, right, the kingdom of God is drawn nigh to you. In other words, all of these works were signs that the kingdom of God had drawn nigh. And so when all of these things disappear, right, the very least, the very least you can infer, right, is that the kingdom of God is no longer nigh. That's the very least you can infer. Now, the most you could infer, now you could take that a step farther and say, well, the kingdom of God is no longer nigh because it's already here, because it was it already came in AD 70, because Jesus Christ returned in AD 70. That's taking a step farther. That's the most you could possibly infer. The least you can possibly infer is all of the, all the signs of the kingdom that Jesus Christ even said were to prove that the kingdom of God has drawn nigh. If those signs are no longer here, then guess what? The kingdom of God is no longer nigh. That's, that's, again, that's something that you can't refute. You could take it a step farther and you could make another, uh, another, um, I guess, another inference and say, well, you know, he came in AD 70 and that's what, but that's, that's taking it a step farther. We, I don't want to go that far because I want to stay with the facts. And the facts are that if those were signs that proved that the kingdom was imminent, right, that the kingdom of God had drawn near, the signs are gone in AD 70, then that must mean that the kingdom of God was no longer near in AD 70. So now watch this. In Ephesians chapter 2, Paul says, well, I don't know if I'll be able to actually find the, 
find the um, the scripture. I'm going to try to find it though. We talks about the ages to come. Let's see. Well, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. So he's talking about is now he says the Gentiles are now participating in Israel's kingdom, in Israel's covenantal and national privileges. Wow, this is crazy because... This was never revealed before. It was never revealed that uncircumcised Gentiles could be co-partakers of Israel's covenantal privileges. This is completely far out. This is something that the prophets, the Old Testament prophets, they did say that um, the Gentiles would be blessed with Israel, right? Shem, I think the the, pro the prophecy that, uh, you know, Shem would be, would, you know, enter the tent of, of uh, or no, Japheth would be, enlarged and would enter the, the tent of Shem, uh, that prophecy. Well, but the, the, the deal was, is if you wanted to, if you wanted to join Israel, you had to be circumcised. Well, now they're joining Israel, right? But they're being circumcised in heart. So the, the law didn't, didn't, um, wasn't abrogated. In other words, it's not like Paul saying, oh, you don't have to be circumcised anymore. In other words, the, the scripture is broken. Now you don't have to be circumcised anymore. Now God's going to save you without circumcision. But no, because now we're under the new covenant. The new covenant has been established, right? Now you're circumcised in heart. That's the only kind of circumcision that matters in this dispensation. And so you can still have access to Israel's covenantal privileges. And meanwhile, guess what? They're, they're about to be cut off. They're about to be there. Those natural branches are about to be cut off out of the olive tree. Now, I did a um, I was in a discussion on Donnie Bedinsky's channel a couple months ago. It was I believe it was with uh, with Scott Clem, uh, Sam Frost, and I think there was one other. I can't remember. Oh yeah, Daniel Aldridge, and I made the the statement. I made the statement that. Um, I forgot what I was going to say. It had to do with the Gentiles, though. And it was just, you know, the, pro the problem with a lot of people is they feel that they don't understand that the Gentiles themselves, they don't have any. Oh, I know what I wanted to say, that I felt that the, the cutting off of the natural branches from the olive tree, that that happened in AD 70, that Paul was speaking proleptically. He was speaking of a coming dispensational change where the Jews would basically, the natural unbelieving branches would be cut off from that olive tree and then the Gentiles would be grafted back in. So I can't get into Romans chapter 11 uh, right now. <clears throat> can't get into Romans chapter 11 right now, but one of these days I'm going to go through that because it's a very important prophecy. It's not talking about individual salvation. It's talking about religious privileges. And I mentioned this during that discussion that I had at Donnie Bedinsky's channel. And there was a lot of kickback, pushback, whatever, however you want to uh, phrase it. But again, uh, what we have to remember is that that cutting off coincides with the, uh, the wicked husbandmen being cast out of the vineyard. So here's where I disagree with, say, Catholics and most um, most Protestants, I disagree with them, is because they'll say that they'll preach supersessionism, right? So they'll say that the present, uh, that the, the the church, right, replaced Israel, and you know, again, this goes back to you know, are there two Israels? Which I don't believe there are. I believe there's only one Israel, but under two different covenants. Well, they'll say the supersessionist replacement theologians will say, well. The church replaced Israel. And that, at the very best, however you slice it, however you dice it, is at the very best, okay, is a half-truth. Because while we know that the, that the, um, that the Jews, uh, that the unbelieving Jews were cast out of the vineyard, right? So they were the leasehold tenants, and they were cast out of the vineyard. We know also that the Gentiles were grafted in. That much we know. 
in fulfillment of Christ's parable of the, of the wicked husbandmen. But then Paul wrote the book of Romans. And, and, and there's another side to that. So this idea of supersessionism, it's not like, okay, well, Israel's been cast off forever. And now the church has inherited all of Israel's blessings. Because there's another side to it. When you read Romans chapter 11, you see, yes, the Jews were about to be broken off right? And then the Gentiles were about to receive, to inherit their religious privileges. So they would be the Gentiles from AD 70 on, the Gentiles would inherit the, that leasehold tenantry, and they would have to produce the works of righteousness, and they would be accountable to God. But at the end of the age, Paul says, in fact, he issues a clear warning that if the Gentiles are not, do not stay faithful, right? What's going to happen? Well, they're going to be cut off, and then they're going to be, and then the Jews are going to be grafted back in. And so this, this concept right here is really important because what he's talking about is he's talking about eschatology, it, no less. I mean, this is, this is eschatology. And so let's see. Yeah, he says, Right here. And if some of the branches be broken off and thou being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree, he says, boast not against the branches. But if thou boast, he says, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. So again, so what he's saying is he's saying that, that you're not, you don't have any standing on your own as a Gentile. In other words, you to get any kind of covenantal standing with God you have to be grafted into the nation. You have to go through the privileged route, which is Israel. Israel is the privileged route of receiving the covenant of all the promises, really. And he says in verse 19, he says, Thou wilt say, then the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in, which is true, right? Paul says, well, because of unbelief, they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed, lest he also spare not thee. So that's that's a standing, that's basically saying if you mess up and if you do the same, if you fall into the same errors that they fell into and cease to produce those works of righteousness and persecute Christ's servants, right? And remain, and you basically wax unfaithful to your trust. Guess what's going to happen? You're going to be cut off. So the Gentile nations, so there's a point in time where the Gentile nations are cut off. And at that point, Israel's grafted back in. And this is where the eschaton kicks in. So that eschaton, which was postponed in the first century, it kicks back in when? After the Gentiles are, are cut off. So this is where I believe we're going right now, right? This is where I believe we're headed right now because all the Gentile nations basically have, have postured themselves officially uh, away from Christianity. Now there's... There's nations that have Christians that have, you know, um, you know, vibrant centers of, of Christian life in them, right? And so there's Christian populations, you know, in the U.S. is, you know, you say we're a Christian nation. We're, we're really not, but we have vibrant centers of Christianity within our, our borders. And so, um, you know, yeah, you could say we're a Christian nation. You could say at one point we were a Christian nation, but have we... We've kind of postured ourselves away from that kind of that profession of Christ. Other nations have actually come out and said, we don't consider ourselves a Christian nation anymore. And of course, the laws that are being enacted and legislation and all that uh, kind of, uh, you know, make us wonder whether we're not coming up on this on this point right here where God's going to cut those Gentile branches off. Right. He's going to take their religious privileges away. And then, of course, he's going to graft the uh, he's going to graft the Jews back in. I think that's what's taking place in Revelation chapter seven. I, I think I said that in my last study. Revelation chapter seven, we see the Jews start to be grafted in again. Now, I think there's going to be a twofold grafting in, but we at least see the tribes. We see this reconstitution of the tribes of Israel. We don't know where they are. I don't know where they are. But we see them being reconstituted. You don't. You don't have to even believe that their 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 DNA is legit. What's going on in that passage is that their Israel is being reconstituted, and so uh, that's got to be the fulfillment of this passage right here. And so all Israel will be saved. And 
I love what what uh, I love what William Pettengill wrote years ago when he said. When he said in verse 26, he said, and so all Israel shall be saved as it is written, period, full stop. And so all Israel shall be saved as it is written. There should be no colon between saved and as. It's Israel will be saved as it is written in the Old Testament. And that's where you can put the colon, say there shall come out of Sion the deliverer and shall turn away in godliness from Jacob, for this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. And so you got to go back to those texts and look to see what he was talking about. But um, obviously it's not, it's not something that's happened. Certainly didn't happen in AD 70. And so it's something that's future. And like I said, I believe those, I believe those, uh, those natural branches were cut off in AD 70. I think that coincides when with the wicked husbandmen were cast out of the vineyard. But again, it's something that you can, you know, you can decide on your own. Anyways, let's see. Anyways, I think that's about it for tonight. Um, I think it's been a great lesson. But again, Acts 28 is really, really important. And uh, hopefully, uh, you know, if you really want to study a good book on Acts 28, it's this little book right here um, by E.W. Bullinger. It's called... The Foundations of Dispensational Truth. Now, I will warn you, because uh, Bullinger was a dispensationalist, but you really, this is the best, this is really the best book that really goes through everything. It's exhaustive. It goes through all of the mechanics of the first century, through the Pentecostal uh, era, goes through the book of Acts, goes through the epistles, and it's just excellent. You really can't beat it. Anyways, I'm going to uh, log off right now, but thanks again. So Sunday night I'll be back, and we'll be talking about uh, Protestantism. Catholics and Protestants are both wrong. Until then, I hope you have a great weekend. God bless, and I'll talk to you soon.